redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through His infinite mercy. This child and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the The King in whose law I delight, whose lovingly guarded my footsteps and giveth me songs in the night. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever. Brother Odell, would you lead us in opening prayer? In your house today, Lord, and just Lord, we just love you and thank you for who you are, Lord. And uh, Lord, we ask you, Lord, that you would just bless everyone that's here today, Lord. And uh, and Lord, if someone here that don't know you, Lord, that they will come to know you, Lord. And uh, and Lord, that we can see a great revival in this country too, Lord. And uh, Lord, see lost souls come back to you, Lord. And uh, and, Lord, we just ask you, Lord, just to be with this church, Lord, and to see it prosper, Lord. And, uh, and just ask you to be with the preacher as he brings us the word this morning, Lord. And we ask you, Lord, in your name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We will sing number uh, 389, which is I will sing the wondrous story, the first, third, and fifth verse. <laughs> Good to have you here this morning with us. We're nothing like technical problems, amen? But we're glad that you're with us and God's blessing we're here. You know, uh, we're moving in. We're, we're, we're almost to the end of summer. I figure by the end of October, it ought to cool down a little bit, amen? Only in Texas do they say, you know, we're getting the cold front coming through. It's only going to be 95 next week. That's all. For all you guys that aren't living here, we're looking for about 101, 102 tomorrow. And so if you're thinking about moving here, remember that. In October, we're going to get snow. Wait and see. We're glad to have you here. I love it. Who would want to live anyplace else? Amen. But Texas, good to have you here with us this morning. Now, and so this is the day that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Isn't that good? Song Amen. for us, for us. We've got a lot of things coming up. We want you to always remember that you can watch the, the videos 
on YouTube. We send you out a link. If you're not getting the link, let me know. I'll make sure that you get it. Your name's added to it a little bit later. Our missionaries of the month are the Pittmans, and they're missionaries to Vanuatu, which is a part of an island country over around Australia and New Zealand. And uh, they've been fan faithful there. Matter of fact, there's quite a few of those Pittmans that are there. And our church is partly responsible for that. God has a plan for it. Uh, the um, the other family, the missionaries, or the wife, is a, her maiden name was Pittman. And she grew up around this preacher. And her dad and I we were friends for a long time. And he was trying to raise a little money to send her over there for a temporary mission summer deal. And so this is way back before, you know, all the great things. We just barely had cell phones. It was like three or four years ago, five years ago, six years, something like that. You know, 10 years ago. Remember when there were dinosaurs about 12 years ago before the kids came in? But anyhow, we were back there and, and I, I stood up on a Sunday night sir in a certain night service and I said, and I called him at his church service in Indiana. He's a pastor there. And I said, if my church wants to know if whatever my church raises, will your church match it so your daughter can go to Vanuatu? Remember that? She needed $5,000, I think, to make the trip and spend a, a month there. And uh, he said, yeah, we'll match it, whatever it is. He was on the phone with his people. I had mine on. We raised $5,600 that night right here. Amen. He has never forgiven me for that either, too, because uh, his church had put a bit. But you know what it did? She went for that one mission intern trip, and she met a man who wanted to be a missionary there. And she married that man, and they've been there as missionaries ever since. The influence was so great. Her brother went over. He also found his wife as a missionary there, and they both, and they're there now. So we got two families that we're kind of responsible for being there. Of course, we'll give Brother Jerry most of the credit since he's the dad, okay, and all that. But, you know, it's amazing what God will do with us if you'll just let him. And sometimes serving the Lord is the most fun of anything that you do. We want to remind you that we're doing the Christmas child thing through the uh, Samaritan's Purse this year. And if you would like to sponsor one of those, if you want to go fill up a box and take care of it, we'll tell you all about it. You can talk to Miss Susie about that. She's the lady sitting up here in front. If you're online and you want to hear about it, you can call our office and we'll explain it to you um, and get it out. But we also want you to remind you that, that you can, if you don't have time to take care of that, there is a way for you to be able to get a box and to send it through our church. And it's cost you $35 and we'll send it out. Now you say, well, my goodness, what are we putting in there? Everything that a, it's divided up into three age groups, the younger, the middle, and then like the teenage group. And then it's boy and girl. So there's six different groups. You can pick out which one you want to buy things for. When I made the original box and it's back in our fireplace room, uh, I put one together and I wanted it to be for an eight to 10 year old girl. So I took an eight year old girl with me and we picked things up at the dollar store that an eight year old girl would want. And she explained to me that eight year old girls all around the world want dolls, Papa. So we got a clock, one of those like a raggedy end doll and this is what they want and that's what they want. And we, in, in that box, you can get about 20 things in there from the dollar store. And there is a list of what you can put in, what you can't put in. You need to see Miss Susie or Jana or me or somebody, but we'll point you toward Miss Susie to get that taken care of. Or if you don't want to do that, you, then there's the box and shipping, and they do that for $9. And you're thinking about me. You say, preacher, nine bucks. You ever mailed anything overseas lately? I, you, you couldn't mail a two by four or six inch package somewhere overseas for $9, guys. Come on. And I, I mailed a, a little. Two little boxes, actually three little boxes this big, that long, about that wide, about that long, to Indiana three weeks ago. It cost me $18 to get it shipped to Indiana. That's like a foreign country, isn't it? You know, but it's, I'm saying that's because my wife is from Indiana, all you guys that don't know, but get involved in this with us. Somewhere there's a kid and you say, well, preacher, you know, what, what do they get? Number one, they don't get many. Our missionary, one of our missionaries was in last, uh, two weeks ago. And in his videos, it showed, it was uh, pictures of his kids there in South America getting one of those boxes. I didn't see one of them saying, man, wish we hadn't got this. They were excited. And, be, and we're excited to be able to know that our missionaries use that. And on top of it, with that $35 price, if you want us to 
comes a 12 week course that they follow up with them because we want to reach them with the gospel. I, I, I think every kid ought to have a toy for Christmas. I think every kid ought to be able to have fun and do something on their birthday. But I want you to understand our main goal in everything we do is to win people to Christ. What, what good would it do? Jesus said, what would it profit a man if he could gain the whole world but lose his own soul? So we, we want to reach them with the gospel, and that'll give a, a 12-week course for them to be a part of. And it's an exciting thing. You say, well, preacher, you know, Bibles are so everywhere. You, you think they are, don't you? Because you live here. In Mexico, years ago, there was a, a time when you couldn't take Bibles into the people. And somehow or another, a case of leather-bound Bibles got into my van and got across the border. I don't know how it happened. It must have been Jana put them in there or something. But And we had a missions meeting with a lot of the pastors. And some of those pastors were pastoring churches in the mountains, guys. I, we don't work in like the big cities. Work in the, that had, they had nothing but New Testament. Some of them just had parts of a New Testament. And we gave them a pastor's study Bible, leather bound. And uh, we gave out the whole case. And, and there was hundreds of other people there. And they were begging for Bibles. I, I only had enough for the pastors. In one of those books, the Bibles at the printer, we the pastor brought it back and they'd printed it different places upside down. They'd like, you know, they put it in a book and section and in the Bible it was turned, some of it was turned backwards. And, and so he, he brought it back and we were, we had enough for all the pastors, but I had that one left and most everybody cleared out. They understand that. And in, in the end of the deal, before I was there and I got that one Bible, I'm putting it back in the box. I'm going to bring it back up here. You know, we would just sew that away. Right. There was a little lady there. She, she's a little older lady. She came down and got in front, in front of me and got down on my knees, on her knees, and begged me for that Bible. I said, it's not. She goes, I have never in my life been able to have a Bible. She said, in the world we live in, see, in America, you can buy a dollar store. That ain't the way it is every place else, guys. We support three printing and shipping ministries just to get the Word of God in people's hands around the world. And she was crying and begged me for that. I gave it to her. She just cried and held it and prayed to God. See, that's, that's what we're trying to do. We have a great privilege in America. You can flip on the radio. You can watch stuff like that. And there's so many people on television preaching the gospel, but that's not the way it is all around the world. There are thousands of places where preachers have never had a whole Bible in their hand. And so when we're talking about shipping things like for this Samaritan's Purse, Christmas child things, we want it to include the Word of God. And, and just handing it out to them is not the answer. Somebody has to teach them. And this comes, if you do that $35 course, that includes a 12-week training program that they get to come back to and, and work with. I, it's, a, it's a great investment for you if you want to try to do it. There's a ladies' missions, uh, ladies' conference coming up, real actually next Saturday, coming up on the 25th. It's here in town. You make sure you talk to Miss Newcomb or, for, or Miss Jana about that. And, of course, we always want you to get together. All the ladies are welcome for the women's prayer circle and all that goes with it. We have a great long prayer list. Most of you every day get something to pray for. We try to keep frivolous things off of there. You know what I mean? And uh, we we will only pray for your dog if it's a Baptist dog. And we charge by the hour. Okay, so, all right. But, anyhow, but we will, you know, I, I, but on the other hand, you know, we don't put it on our prayer list. But I have prayed for people who've lost their dogs. That's a great loss. You understand that? You say, well, why do you? Yeah, I, I never have quite gotten that attached to any of that. The only animal I ever got that attached to was a horse. But so, but a lot of you guys are. And sometimes you think about that for those people that live by themselves and they have a pet and the pet passes away. Yeah, we, we will pray about that, okay, whether the dog is Baptist or not. But uh, 
we will remind you that your prayers are important. And you say, well, preacher, you know, how many does it take us to pray? I don't know. But I'm thinking, we always think this way. Right? The more I can, I can get you to pray for any issue, whether it's a missionary or a sick person or a family loss or you know any, or anything that's going on, the more that we can pray for each other, and the scripture says that, pray you one for another, right? That God will hear. And so that's what we're going to do right now and help bow your heads and let's pray together. Father in our heaven, what a privilege it is to know that we're talking to the God of heaven. When Jesus told us to pray, he didn't say, I want you to pray through this channel and pass it up and the Father will get a hold of it. He said, just right off the bat, say, Our Father, which art in heaven. And Lord, it's, it's in a bit intimidating when we remember who we're praying to, but it's exciting to know that the God of all creation hears me when I pray. I, as much as I can understand in my flesh, I'm overwhelmed with that. They don't understand how you can do it. I just know that you do. So today, when we ask you for our missionaries, the ones we can call by name and the ones that we can't, we ask you to touch every ministry that's going on this day. And Lord, for the rest of the day, in whatever place they are, may the Spirit of God work in the hearts of those they speak to today. And may the Spirit of God work in our hearts as your word is read and studied today as well. Lord, we love you. Thank you that you're a God of compassion. And for that cause, we bring those that are in our families that are hurting and that are sick. And Lord, who need special things in their lifetime, some physical, some emotional, some mental, and a lot spiritual. Father, we pray all these things that we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I really enjoy your singing. than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands. I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hands than to be the Jesus than anything this world affords today. I'd rather have Jesus than men's applause. I'd rather be faithful to his dear cause. I'd rather 
rather have Jesus than worldwide fame. I'd rather be true to his holy name than to be the king of a vast domain or be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. If you got your Bibles, you can turn there to the book of Isaiah, chapter number 46. Chapter 46. Uh, when I'm reading the Word of God, and uh, I come across something, every once in a while, things will just kind of jump off the page at you. There are certain things, and I love to read the book, and I like for God to show me things. I'm always asking Him to do that. And you say, how's it working? Well, almost a half a century, about six years away from that, and uh, I have not been short any being able to find something to preach. Matter of fact, I'm working on series and series, and I just, there's not enough time uh, to be able to teach and to preach the Word of God. We want to encourage you to, if you don't come to Sunday school, will you look at our our Sorry, we don't do Sunday school anymore. It is Bible study. Amen? It's Bible study. There are no fat people in the world, just obese people. Okay, so we want to be nice when we say that kind of stuff, all right? Uh, and <clears throat> But anyhow, no short people either, that's vertically challenged people, right? Now, I did hear a story about that once. They said, you know how you can tell when you're really, really short? It's when your feet show up in your driver's license picture. I didn't. I didn't make that up. I just thought it was over. And you know, because I, I like for people to think. Now, part of you don't think much, and I'm sorry about that. But anyhow, but we do. Now, I'm, I'm one of those guys. I like those silly things. You know, that makes you think about things later. You know what I mean? Kind of like the professor that created a clone of himself, but he turned out to be the opposite personality. Y'all ever hear that? When he was showing him off at a scientific preview, the, every time he asked a clone to talk, he cussed and screamed and said nasty stuff until the clone couldn't stand it. The professor couldn't get any stand it. And so he thought, well, I got written. He threw him out the window of this six story building. They arrested the professor for making an obscene clone fall. <laughs> Part of y'all still didn't get it. You know what? Y'all listen to you. You got it. You know, pretend it's Little House on the Prairie. But I'm going to work it that way. How about that? But I want you to think with me today about something. How absolute is our God? How absolute is He? How unique is He? How unique is our God? How much does the devil try to keep you from seeing those two things? How loving is He? How kind is he? How caring is he? Well, I want you to see something that I saw when I was reading through the book of Isaiah chapter 46. And I'm going to start reading in verse number one. These two people, these two things that he mentions first are two false gods, Baal and Nebo. Now, there is a mountain called Mount Nebo, but that's not it. He's talking about a, fa a false god. That's the mountain of that god, by the way. That's why they say that. Baal boweth down. Nebo stoopeth. Their idols upon their beasts and upon the cattle. Their carriages were heavy laden. They are a burden to the weary beast. Now I want you to understand, get a picture of this before we get going. Here we have an idol being delivered. Let's take Nebo as one. For where that Mount Nebo is was where they had a temple 
and they had to carry this created, handmade, man-made image, God, up the mountain. And most of the time, you can see, this is it has to be spectacular. You, 30 foot tall, weighs seven or eight tons, made it out of rock, and they're dragging it up the side of this mountain to set it on the top. Okay, now can I look at it again? They were upon the beast and upon the cattle because they pulled their wagons and carts with oxen and horses. They are a burden to the weary beast. Does that make more sense to you now? They're just wearing them out. Think of how much time has been put into this. Carving something out of a tree stump or carving something out of a black or rock. And then you have to transport it to someplace else. Then you have to set it up on the, something that you've made to hold it up and take care. And this goes on and on. Now watch this. They stoop. They bow down together. They could not deliver the burden. But they themselves are got into captivity. What in the world? He's saying they can't even get themselves to their own temple. And then you put them in there and they can't get out. They're in captivity. They're in solitary confinement for the rest of their life. Because you put you this stone god in there and it can't get in and it can't get out. It's just a piece of material carved into some shape. Now listen to what God says to Israel. Hearken unto me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnant of the house of Israel, which are born by me. Those gods had to be carried everywhere they went. And immediately he makes the statement, I have been carrying you. I have been carrying you. Which are born by me from the belly, that is from being born, which are created in the womb, even to your old age, I am he. And even to whore hairs, that word whore is like, how many of you have ever heard somebody say, well, looks, we had that whore for us this morning. It just means what? Frost just fine. Isn't it cool? Will I carry you? All of your life. All of your situations. Everything you're going through. I'm always there. You're putting all of your energy into dragging some rock and some tree stump to some magnificent thing that cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars in our money today to produce. You had to put it in there because it couldn't get there by itself. And then you shut the door and it's captive because it can't get out. I'm the one that brought you into the world. We'll talk about that in just a second. And he said, I'm the one that took care of you when you were there. And all of your life, even to your old age, I will carry and will deliver you. Now watch this. To whom will you liken me and make an equal and compare me that we may be alike? Which one of those false gods can do that? Which one of those? Kind of interesting now, and see when you break it down and see what he's talking about to them. You know, idol worshippers have to carry their gods. Our God carries us. Every false god demands an extreme sacrifice from us. But our God provided an extreme sacrifice for us. Think about the opposite. To whom will you liken me? You're comparing me. You know what the difference between good is? Evil, right? Good and evil. How about the difference between night and day, all right? Dark and light, right? You understand there is nothing to compare God to. Is there an opposite of God? It sure isn't the devil because he's nowhere as powerful as God, as good as God, and he, he's not as bad as God is good. 
He's a created being just like everything else that's in existence today. And the God that made him, he's the only creator. Who would you compare me to? Who am I like? They lavish gold out of the bag. They weigh silver to the balance. Hire a goldsmith. He maketh a god and they fall down and they worship it. In America, we're not, we're not like that. That's a waste of time making it into an image. We just worship it right in the wallet. Amen. If you don't believe that's true, check and see. One of the things that every police association teaches you right quick is you want to find out what's going on, follow the money. You want to know what's going on in America? Find the money. Follow the money. Where's the money going? You'll understand why we're doing what we're doing. You say, none of that stuff makes sense. Follow the money. When I was a young man, I worked with a really wonderful man that um, who was a Christian, and I wasn't. I didn't understand half the things he was telling me all the time. He was a, a black guy, very smart, very wise, and some reason or another took compassion on me. And he put up with me. And later became, when I got saved, he became one of my good friends. But he would say, he'd look at me and he'd go, George, when things don't make sense, it's cause there be a buck in it. And his name was Jack. And I'd say, what does that mean, Jack? He said, you find out someday. When things don't make sense, it's cause there be a... Guys, these guys are taking their silver and their gold and they're, somebody's making money out of this. Do you understand that? I, I guarantee you, go to the New Testament. Go and look at the travels of Paul and Peter and one, look how many people turned against him. Especially Paul mentions one of them by name, Alexander the silversmith. Hey, if you come in and you teach that gospel that there's only one God, we're making our living, making a fortune because people are bringing us silver and gold to make gods out of. We'll lose our trade and our income. Follow the money, guys, and see where it's going with. They lavish gold out of a bag, weigh silver in a balance, hire a goldsmith, he make it a god, and they fall down, yea, they worship it. Now, you know one of the things every false god demands? To be appeased. Have you ever seen anybody worshiping anything that doesn't have to be appeased? You know, if you worship your dead ancestors, you have to offer them some kind of offering so they don't come back and choke you in the bed while you're sleeping, I guess. All have to be appeased. You know what? God never did that with us. There wasn't anything we could do to change the situation we were in as sinners. He never one time said, you do this and you do that and you do this and you do that. Everything that required of us was a, faith, a step of faith so that he would offer an ultimate sacrifice for us. And it wasn't to be appeased. That was never God's plan to keep us away from him. Do you understand that? His plan was always to have us with it. From the very beginning, the last one of the last things the Lord Jesus said, Father, in John 17, I, I want them with me. You, These are mine. I've left them in the world. Will you keep them while they're in the world? But Father, I want them with me. I want them to be where I am when I'm with you. That's our whole plan. And that's what the whole thing about Christianity is about. The Bible says, Then came the Lord unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Isn't that cool? There's, there's false gods, you, you know. You have to make them. Our God knows us before we're born. This come out of the book of Jeremiah, and it's pretty cool, because he said, You know, not only did I know thee, but the next verse it said, I called thee while you're still in the womb. I heard the coolest story this week. I listened to a guy on the radio talking about a pregnancy center, and he worked at it as, as a doctor. He said a young couple came in, and you know they were really young. They were in the teens, and they came in. The girl was expecting a baby. She was three or four months long. They were, they were coming in to see, you know, I want to do an, ador, a, an abortion. And somebody talked them in to come in and get an ultrasound to see the kid before it's born. Now, I guess, guys, you want to know why we support the right to life places and why we support the women's shelters and those things around here? that we helped them get the money together just to put ultrasounds in. First thing they did is they got that ultrasound. If you've seen those, those are kind of what they got that one now that's like the 3D one. It's almost, it's like you can see the kid in the womb still. 
and said the, the boy, big old guy was sitting over there. You know, you could tell he was a jock and he was always and had the girl there with him. And, you know, he wasn't speaking. He's trying not to see what's going on. And he said, I, we purposely have the screen up there for them to see. And said, we're looking around and, and it was a boy that could tell it already. And you could see the shape of its face. And the, and he goes, man, look at this guy's hands. He's going to be an athlete. And said, the kid looked up and he goes, show it to me again. And said, he showed it to him. He said, he has hands and feet. And said, he turned and looked at his own hand and looked back and he goes, and, and they're just like mine. In the sex of the next sentence that come out of his mouth was, we can't abort my baby. Listen to me, guys. Do you understand that God made us together? David said, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Before I was, before my bones came together, before the sinews of my flesh, God knew me in the womb. Isn't that good stuff? That's what we want. Hearken unto me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnant of the house of Israel. That's verse 4. Verse 5 and 6, look at this. That were born by me from the belly, which are carried from the womb, even to your old age, I'm he. Every time I think about all the people in the whole world that are out there, and all the kids in our country, and all the teenagers in our country, who are around millions of people, and then absolutely alone. I, there's an answer for that. There is one who will never leave you. No, for a second. We have people packed around us all over. We live in this giant big old town with this giant big old cities in this giant big old metroplex. And every one of us feel more alone now than we did when we were kids growing up out in the country. Amen. There's one who knows the thoughts and intents of your heart, the needs of your life. He knew you before you were born. He said, I'm going to be there. I'll carry you to the last day of your age. I like that. It's good stuff, isn't it? Verse 5 says, To whom will you liken me and make me equal? Who, can, who is like that? If I didn't preach anything else on the whole message, who's like that? There's nobody like that. I had high school friends. Did you have high school friends? I remember telling my daughter, she, she was really infatuated with friends. It's good to have a friend. I said, two years after you're out of high school, you'll be lucky to know where any three or four of them are. The year after you got out of high school, they didn't want you back. If you came on the campus, they tossed you off. Remember? You didn't belong there anymore. And your friends scattered out. They got their own lives. You got your own life. They lavish gold. They make it themselves. If, listen to me, guys. If, if you create your own God, then you're greater than your God. Amen. And certainly to hear. If you create your own God, if money is your God, you're greater than your God. If you make a statue and you lavish it with gold or you whatever you whatever because you have you're always greater than your God and you're the one that gives all those things to it and it owes everything to you. You say, what does that mean? I'm headed somewhere. They that make them are like unto them. So is everyone that trusteth in them. The scripture says, if you look down in those things. They bear them on their shoulder because they can't go. They put them in their place. They stand there. They cry unto him. He can't hear. He can't answer. And he can't get him out of any kind of trouble. He said, everybody that believes in a God like that is just like that. David would say in the Psalms, he would say, the idols of the heathen are silver and gold, the works of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. They have ears, but they hear not. They have eyes, but they see not. They have ears. Neither is there any breath in their mouth. They that make them are like unto them, just like Isaiah said. Can you think about that? that? When I first read that, I thought, that is the coolest thing. You know why they're just like what they worship? Because they created what they worshiped. They made a God to fit who they are. And their wickedness in their lifetime. You ever do any study of the Greek gods? My goodness, humans aren't that bad. 
Our God's not like that. Our God is a God of compassion and love and care, and He never does wrong. Now, I'm going someplace. Stick with me. Because I'm going down. Remember this and show yourselves, men. Bring it again to mind. Because the Scripture says, in verse, get you down with me in verse number 9, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God. He said, remember who, who you can compare me to? I am God. In verse number nine. And there is none like me. There is none like me. You say, well, wow. When you think about that. Do people really believe that they're their own gods? Mm, how far do you want me to look? What about the next chapter in verse 8? How about let's turn all the way over to the next chapter in verse 8. We are in Isaiah. God's talking about Babylon and the people of Babylon. He said, therefore, hear now this, thou art given to pleasure, thou dwellest carelessly, thou sayest in thine heart, I am and none else beside me. Say, really thought so? Look at verse 10. Thou hast trusted in wickedness, None that say, none see me, thy wisdom and knowledge, it hath perverted thee, thou hast said in thine heart, I am, and none else besides me. You know what? I want you to get something. God's going to tell you, and you look up in your Bible anytime you want, you're going to find over and over and over and over and over again, God will tell you, I am, and there is none else. Nothing else can take the place of God. Nothing else can take the place of God. Somebody a lot smarter than me one time said that what you need to understand is that inside of every human, there's this God-shaped vacuum. And you can fill it with sex. You can fill it with money. You can fill it with wickedness. You can fill it with depravity. You can fill it with the good. You can, but it won't work because God made you to be with him. That's what he did. He made the man, made the woman, got to come around and be around them every day until their sin separated them from their God. And then he spent this whole time with all the many offspring of those two trying to get us back to himself. Yeah, there's none like me. There's none like me. The Lord did sit his love, love upon us. Think what I'm talking to you. If you don't receive the love of God, He still loves you. If you've refused the Christ and you end up in hell separated from Him, you'll have to do it by tripping over the love of God to get there because He'll never quit loving you. The Lord did set His love upon you to choose you, nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people. He's talking to Israel. And he talks those same things to us. Over and again, through this portion of Scripture, you'll find in the last chapter, he mentions us. He mentions us. There's, I'm going to have a people that aren't people now. I'm going to reach those. In three chapters over, he's going to say, not only am I going to send you to send my people Israel, but I'm going to make you a light unto, my, unto the Gentiles. Back in the book of Isaiah. That was his whole call for us, guys. Look, did ever a people hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of a fire as thou hast heard and live? I've never heard God speak audibly. He talks to my heart a lot. For if God has said to go and take him a nation from the midst of another nation by temptations, by signs, by wonders, by war, by mighty hand, by stretched out arm, by great terrors, according to all the Lord God did for you in Egypt before your eyes, unto thee was it showed. That thou mightest know that the Lord, He is God, and there is none else. Nobody would do that. God did that for them because He loved you. Can you get that? Israel could never get it. Half of Christianity doesn't get it. God saved you. God followed after you. God sought you because He loved you. From the time you were conceived, for the rest of eternity, I promise you. If you reject him, you reject him, but you'll have to do it over his love. Look at this. Out of heaven, he made thee to hear his voice. 
He might instruct thee upon the earth. He showed thee great fire. Thou heardest the signs. Remember that at, at Mount Sinai? Look at the last part of that. I put it in red. Know therefore this day and consider in thine heart the Lord, he is God in heaven above and upon the earth beneath. There is none else. Over and over and over again. See that refuse not him that speaketh, for they escape not who refused him that spake on earth. How much more shall they we escape, not we escape, if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven? I want you to think about me, because I want you to get what happens. You know why God went to all the trouble to get you the word of God? So you would know how much he loved you. Now you say, well, preacher, the God of the Old Testament wasn't very loving. Anybody got a concordance beside me? You can go get you one. For 30 bucks, you can get one put on your computer. You can just punch it in. It'll come up. Look how many times those Old Testament saints talked about the love of God. Just, just read through the Psalms. They, they knew him as a loving God. He cared for them. He carried them out of Egypt. And the whole time they're griping and spitting and complaining and rebelling. And he fed them every day and he watered them every day and they their shoes didn't wear out and they stayed healthy and he did all those things and led them through the wilderness and put them in their land. I don't care how option that they got. He called them one time. They said, you got four heads of flint and got an ex of stone. That's pretty hard headed. Amen. But he said, I love you. I want you to know that. And in Kings, there's only been one message from the very beginning to the end, guys. Come unto me, trust my promises. Listen to what Solomon says. Let these words, when I have made supplication before thee, he's dedicating the temple, be nigh unto our Lord, our God, day and night, that he maintain the cause of his servant, the cause of his people Israel, and at all times as the matter shall require, <clears throat> that all the people of the earth may know that the Lord is God and there is none else. There is none else. I like this. Have you, <clears throat> have you ever looked at your life and going, why in the world has God put up with me? You ever done that? You say, no, I, I wake up every morning and say, God's lucky to have me. I bet not. Have you ever thought about it? What in the world does he do that for? I was telling my Bible study class this morning. I'm, <clears throat> I'm working on my 80-year-old tractor. Seriously, made 1941. It's like a big jingle puzzle, trying to put it back together, all right? And I was playing with the, the absolute necessary spring. It's just about four or five times as big as a pen spring. Holds the whole tractor together. You think it does, because it won't work without it. Pitching it down and playing, and, I, and it went, and it fell into the largest pile of junk in the world. So what are you doing about it? I'm thinking about, I went and bought another spring because I'm never finding that one. You said, why don't you just ask God? God, show me where that spring is. <laughs> Guys, you don't, you don't know something? I thought about that because I ask him that all the time. God, where did I put my phone? God, where did I put my car keys? God, where am I at? Y'all ever do that? Every once in a while? <clears throat> Most of the time, it's why am I in this room? I ask him for all kinds of things, and he's an amazing, wonderful, sufficient God. You know, you know what surprises me over and over? Is he never goes, that's too little for me. I'm really busy out here with the whole situation. Does that not ever surprise you? You know, it, it should have surprised Israel that no matter what they did, God, through the book of Isaiah and his word, says, All Israel shall be saved in the Lord with an everlasting salvation and shall not be ashamed or confounded, world without end. Isn't that, a, isn't that a wonderful promise that God's never going to give up on them? What about us? We already have a spirit. D do you not think? I am the Lord and there is none else. There's no God beside me. I girded thee, but though thou hast not known me, 
that they may know from the rising of the sun from the west. For those of you who don't know which way the sun comes up, he just told you. And from the west, that's the opposite of the rising of the sun. That there is none beside me. I am the Lord. There is none else. Now, I want you to watch these next verses. I form the light. I create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Drop down your heavens from above. Let the skies pour down righteousness. Let the earth open. Let them bring forth salvation. Let righteousness spring up together. The Lord, I, the Lord, have created it. Did, did you get all that together? He's pretty busy unto him, isn't he? But the scripture says this. And all of that, his promise was that no matter what goes on in the world, and no matter what happens in your life, he wasn't too big to deal with it. You say, I wish I, you ever want a friend? Have you ever noticed? Uh, Y'all, I'm not, not, don't take everything I say in this gospel, okay? But I figured out something. Have, you know what group therapy is? You know why it works so well? It's a whole bunch of people with the same problem complaining to other people about what they got and they all understand. Amen? And it works for us. My, you know, my, my father passed away. Yours, oh, your father passed away? All of a sudden, it seems really wonderful that somebody knows how you feel. Doesn't it? Come on. I've got a rebellious kid and she does this and that and the other. And they go, well, you know, I got a rebellious kid. And for some reason, it makes us feel better. They got a rebellious kid too. You know what I mean? Years ago, I was working in a counseling place and as a volunteer and I had a man and his wife come in and they had adopted a daughter. And daughters are unique when they're adopted. And how many, anybody adopted here that you're a woman, somebody adopted you. Guys and daughters are different. Men, boys and girls are different. God made them that way. And that is that may not be acceptable in the world today, is it? That boys and girls are different. We not only don't look alike, we don't think alike, we don't have the same emotions and none of that stuff, okay? Girls are always worried. If I'm adopted, why didn't my real parents want me? There must be something wrong with me. And if you wait till they're 20 to tell them, you know, well, you know, you were adopted. They, they go to pieces. Oh, no, I was adopted because 20. And somehow the 20 years before don't seem to mean as much. They have to get over that. You know what happens when you tell a 20-year-old boy that, hey, you know what? You're not really ours. <clears throat> we adopted you. He'll look at you and go, are we going to eat soon? We didn't get lunch. Are we going to eat soon? It just seems easier for them. But I was talking with a man. He was a colonel in a special forces branch of the military. And he and his wife were there. And they were talking about his, he started talking about his daughter. I, said, I heard the story 40 times, 50 times, 60 times. And I said, does she do this? Said, yeah. Does she do that? Yeah. Does she do this? Yeah. Does she do that? Oh, yeah. And, and this is one of the things you deal with, guys. And sometimes as humans, because see, we're adopted by God. And Christian people have the same problem sometimes with God. And they have to keep getting him to prove that he still loves them. They'll start out like this. They'll, when they start realizing that, they'll do something. You know, you didn't want me to do this, but I did it. You still love me? And so they knock over the shot sticker. Still love me? Yeah. Next thing you know, they pour out a cup of coffee on the floor. They still love me? And it escalates and it keeps getting bigger and bigger because they know somewhere out there that you're going to go, okay, I don't love you anymore after you did that. And every parent that did has been through that right now. And you're listening or you're here. You've been through that. Blended families go through that. Like every day has to be a proof day. Because we just can't believe that somebody could just love us because we're us. And it's even worse when somebody else, you thought they didn't want. You know what? That wasn't true. 
Thank God for all the wonderful young ladies who give their kids up for adoption and don't have them aborted. Thank God for every one of them. Somebody cared enough about you and loved you that gave you life and brought it in. You ought to thank God for them. Maybe be like some of our families that after 30 or 40 years find their real mom and they're all happy and everybody's together and you didn't know the situation. What if she's 14 or 15 or 16 years old? She can't raise you. She did the only best, best she knew how. And there's no condemnation in this for me, guys. I got an adopted daughter and I praise God for the ability to have her every day, even when she don't do what I like. But as Christians, sometimes we want to do that to God. Well, if I just was, you know, I know you saved me by grace. And I know that, guys, I want you to get this. God made the earth for people. The scripture says he made it to be inhabited. Now, I don't know about all the people that think that Humans are a pestilence on the earth, but I want you to understand if it wasn't for humans, God wouldn't have made the place. Because he made a creature that who had the ability to make their own choices and then turn around and make the choice to trust him. That's what this whole thing about Christianity is about. And God was willing to come in the form of that creature because see, all we had to do to do, to get this started with, all we had to do was to have one man get into sin to bring sin into the world. And all we had to do to have a cure for it is have one man be sinless. Now that is a tough one. Because there's millions and billions of sinners. But there's only been one sinless. And that one sinless one came into the world for the very reason to save us. And you'll hear him say, for this cause came I into the world. For this cause came I into the world. All we needed was one perfect man. And there hadn't been but one. And that's the God man, the Lord Jesus Christ. To die for us. When you read the story of the cross, listen to me. They offered him vinegar mixed with gall. Kill the pain a little bit. He wouldn't take it. You know why? He wasn't trying to get out of the pain. He was bearing our pain. The scripture says, who bore our sin on the cross. Listen to me. I am the Lord. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it, he created it not faint, he formed it to be inhabited. That's how I know that. I am the Lord, and there's none else. When I get all the way over to the book of Peter, I hear Peter say, before the foundation of the world, that the Lord Jesus Christ is as the lamb slain before God before he ever made the earth, before he ever made a man to stand on it. He already had a salvation plan written out. And the scripture says, and that word, that plan, was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father. The psalmist would ask it. They would say that. He's a man after God's own heart. Every once in a while he could see who he really was and say, what is man that they're mindful of him and the son of man that thou visiteth him? He also knew who he was, but he knew God was sending one and over and over he would use those words. And the son of man. You know who that is? That's God himself in the flesh. That's the Lord Jesus. God made the man to dwell with him and he paid the price to make sure it does. And every time he gives out one of these things, he ends it up with this. He keeps saying, there is no God else beside me, a just God, a Savior. There is none beside me. There is none else. There is none else. Now, I know the world is looking for something. They're looking for an answer. They're looking for a plan. They're looking for 
something. And they're looking for it in all kinds of places. But none of those are the right places. There's only one way. There's only one plan. And there's only one place to find it. And that's when you come back to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Because I can tell you this about him. Look unto me, be saved all you ends of the earth, for I am God. And there is none else. Can you quote that verse I had up there? I took it off real quick. I bet you can. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. There's not anybody else. There's not a false God. There's not one of those fake religions. There's not one of those man-made things. To get. Nothing compares to that. Nothing. And over and over again, God would remind you, for I'm God. There is none else. There's no other name under heaven given among men, whereby you must be saved. And I'm telling you, you are a privileged people to know him as your Savior. To be able to say, think about this, the God of everything said, our Father. You're a privileged people. He knew you before you knew him. He loved you before you loved him. He cared for you and still does if you'll let him. He'll carry you from birth to death. But not only that, through the Lord Jesus Christ, he's made a way for you to be carried right into eternity with him. There's no other God like that. I, I don't have to destroy my enemies to be able to get into a paradise. I don't have to stand here today and say, you've got to do all kinds of wickedness or you won't be able to get it. I can tell you right now, the scripture says, for God so loved the world, and that's you, that he gave, he already has a plan, his only begotten son, that whosoever believes, that if you by faith receive him, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. I, I'm grateful I got a home in heaven. I'm grateful that I'm going to be redeemed and Resurrected into a new body someday. But I'm grateful that between right then and now, that same God said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I don't know what you're looking for, but if you've never put that into your life, you really missed out. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, and I'm grateful that. Lord, what a wonderful thing. Our Father, which art in heaven, we're asking you, Lord, to remind us. We're forgetful people. I'm preaching these messages to me. I live in a world that seems to have gone absolutely crazy. Not just a town, or not just a state, but not and even our own country, but the world. And it's simply because they've left God and sought something else to be a God. But we know you, and we know who you are. Most of us claim you as our personal Savior. Help us to live for him. Tell other people about him. And together rejoice that we have a father we call our father, who is the God of all creation, who is eternal and has given unto us eternal life. And Lord, we stop and right now say, nothing compares to you. There is no God like unto you. For you're unique. You're the creator. You're the sustainer. You're the life giver. You're the Savior. Lord, thank you for that and for the chance that we've had to hear and believe it. And we ask today that you remind us constantly that there's none else besides you. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with me. Number 163. You're here. You don't know Christ. Now's the time. Today is the day. Amen. Every soul by sin oppressed, their mercy with the Lord, and He will surely give you rest by trusting in His Word. Only trust Him, only trust Him, only 
trust him now. He will save you. He will save you. He will save you now. Amen. Amen. At least half of you did. Amen. We're glad to have you with us today. You know, we, <clears throat> I always tell you, I can, I can let my computer run for days and weeks at a time. When you all walk in, it starts doing weird stuff all the time. And I, I want you to understand, I'm up here preaching, and this is what my computer shows. What do you think? Isn't that cool? That won't be on the video put out, but we'll let you just know. So I'm watching out of the corner of my eye, and I'm trying to figure out. I'm almost doing sure where I'm at. Amen. <clears throat> but I do know one thing. we got a great God, God, nothing compares to Him. Let's have a word of prayer. Brother Bob. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for who you are, Lord. What a great Amen. God you are, Lord. You're so precious. There's none else like you, Lord. And Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be here, Lord, together to worship you, Lord. Help us, Lord, with our small minds, our limited minds, Lord, just to, to have some understanding of the great love that you have to us, Lord. And Lord, help us, Lord, to spread that message of your love to the world. Lord, yes. we love you. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.